Good morning, everybody. We're waiting for we're waiting for our Rosemary, are you there? I don't know. I thought I saw her. Um, let's see. That's working. I think she's on the internet. It's actually going to be in live. Me. What? Yeah. Live. Yeah. Live. Live and in person, certainly. Well, I hope everyone's enjoying Passover more than I am. You really love Monson. No, I don't. Really, really. Trust me. Trust me. That's why I'm late today. And I don't, I tried not to eat any yesterday, and I still, my stomach is still bugging me. But, um, what? Oh. So. Okay. Uh, anyways, but I'm here. I had uh I had well like a lot of people having uh yeah I've been there a lot having I have rice now. Oh okay. I had rice, so that allowed me a little bit of a little bit of having something not not made out of moss. Yeah. Oh, any kind of rice. So, um, but man, I can't stand this. But I had, uh, but uh, yeah, at least I lost some weight this week. That's <laughs> all I can tell you. You like matzo bra? No, you it no I don't like it any piece. <laughs> I don't like any piece of it. No piece of this I like. Uh, no. Do you like matzo bra? Yeah, most Jews like matzo bread. I like matzo period. Well, the thing you can't have fish uh, being vegetarian. Yeah, if I could eat meat, I would be fine. Okay. It's the it. only time of year that I actually kind of sometimes wish I ate meat just so I could have something. But because uh, all all my veggie products are not kosher for pasta, all of them have wheat gluten in it. So all the Impossible Burgers and all the just salad. I don't like salad, Doc. Yep. I don't like anything. I don't like anything out of the ground that's like not been dance. processed. No, I wouldn't. You would. I couldn't. I could tell you. No, you would. My dad made the best. Everybody says they make the best. Oh, and, then I, make and then I eat it. And I'm like, just give me a pancake. This is a bad pancake. I love pancakes. It's because I love, I love pancakes. That's why. I love bread. That's the problem. I love bread. I could just eat bread. I told you. I, could, I, I am very simple. Bread and butter would be. I could live in prison. Well, <laughs> I'm sorry. there's other there's other parts of prison. I don't. I don't want. I don't want to be part of. I don't want to be part of. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Oh, yeah. Did you ever get your Dutch crunch bread? Of course. Of course. The best. Gosh, yeah, that place was a good. That was a good bakery. That was a good bakery. Well, anyways. Um, but I did have, I did have rice yesterday, so that was good. And I, the day before too, I had uh, sushi. One, day. Uh, one more day. No, it's till Thursday. 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 Well, Wednesday's the seventh day. So Rabbi, when do you eat late? What? 
The yard side yeah. candle? Wednesday, Wednesday night, night is, yeah, is the yard side. Wednesday. We have we have a few left if people I have one. They all got taken. I think we had three left. Uh, we we brought them. Um but uh so yeah, we're still waiting for some PO. Oh, people are still coming on. There's John's I I know I saw so Rosemary's here in person today. Oh my goodness. Uh wow. So um yeah, we we're um we have last Wednesday we didn't have class uh night because we had Seder, but we had a lot of people and it was a lot of fun. Considering that there was a lot of people there, it was a lot of fun. And then I found out there was a lot of people that didn't come. I don't know why. Yeah. Why? Yeah, uh, Sean didn't come. He was supposed to come. He didn't come to class. No, well, some of them, yeah, did RSVP, but then there were other people that just like, I don't know, they thought like it was going to be weird because it was at the senior center. I loved it there. I hope to be there again. There's nothing wrong with it. But there were seniors that were like, I don't want to go to the senior center. I'm like, what's wrong with the senior center? It was very nice. It's a nice place. It's a really nice place. It's one of the nicest rooms in Santa Clarita, honestly. There's not many rooms that are. It's pretty large, if I remember. It's, it's a nicer room than most of the places you can have a party at, period. I'd have a bar mitzvah there. I'm not joking. You think I'm kidding? I'm not joking. I would do. I would rent it out for a bar mitzvah. I, I agree 100%. What? I agree 100%. It's a great facility. But people, But there were seniors that are like, I'm not going to step foot in the seniors. And I'm like, what's wrong? Like, that doesn't make you get older. Maybe, <laughs> maybe it does. I didn't know about it, but I didn't feel any older. Maybe. But uh, I just feel tired. <laughs> what? Yeah, I know. Well, anyways, they they uh, um, yeah, it, they were very nice to work with, and I think we will do it again there because, assuming that they liked it, and they were like, if we next year we can get a grant, we can do it for even cheaper. And I'm like, charging twenty five dollars. I I said I don't even think that I don't, I don't think there's a place in America that's charging twenty five dollars for a seder. I said that the messianic, no, I'm serious. The messianic Jews were charging 45 yeah. and they're, and they always undercut us because they're always trying to trick somebody into coming to a Seder. I'm not kidding. I understand, but people didn't know. They didn't know. It, it would be good if we could do high holidays there too. Uh, maybe I'm we're, we're I'm open to it that they were very nice to work with. I think the one problem about high holidays though, and we, we talked about, uh, with Tracy and I walked out saying the same thing. One problem with high holidays is the seating. Um, the seating in the church is a little bit more like regular seating and, uh, you know, like more comfortable. The one, you know, when we used to do services at, at the Hyatt, it was, uh, it was hard when you're in the back to see and you feel like really far away. I don't know how churches, we how churches, it doesn't matter. Even if we had 200 people, 300 people, it still feels far away. You can't yeah. get, you can't feel like you're that close. In a church, you can put 300 people in a church and it feels closer. So I don't know. I mean, why, don't, why don't you do high holidays in the round? We could, we could, but it's, uh, it's, uh, it, you don't want to have your backs to people, you know? I mean, but you have them more in the round. I mean, you could have like a semicircle, you know? Well, if I remember correctly, many years, but uh, up in the hill, um, even S. Weiss was in the round, wasn't it? Yeah, he? kind of. Kind of. There are, there, I mean, well, synagogues are. There are more, I mean, not are, they can be. They don't have to be, but churches are, oftentimes are. And they're, and they're speaking of churches is Reverend Lynn. How was Easter, Reverend Lynn? Whoa, whoa. Was it good? Was it good? Excellent. Yeah, excellent. Good. Yeah. So energized? Uh, exhausted. <laughs> no, it was wonderful. Well, Easter Sunday was the first day that I had a chance to rest. Uh, we had, I don't. You have your Yeah, yeah. No, I. Oh, I shouldn't say this. I was over. What day was it? I was over. Yeah, so I think it was Sunday. It was at uh, Eden, and the staff. One of the staff person people were there. I'm friends with. I don't want to out them as this, but they, they were at the. They were having lunch at the at the Eden, and they had a ham and cheese sandwich <laughs> on bread. And so one of the guys was there who was Jewish. And, you know, I, I guess they don't have a policy in the, in the cemetery that they can't bring in non-kosher food. So the guy says, it's a trifecta. He says, it's like <laughs> ham and cheese, milk and meat, milk and meat, ham, and bread. He said everything. He had everything. He had every, 
Yeah, it was the full trifecta yeah, of. No, no, no. It could have been, but it wasn't. No, it, it just so happens it wasn't. The Jewish person saw, was was there and was saw it. This is my aunt's piece. Yeah, it's not. There's not many Jewish people that work there anymore. There's there's one guy who happened to be there. He's not even usually in that room. He works at the cemetery side, but that was in the mortuary. I should I shouldn't like. They're very they they they're very good to the Jewish. I mean, it's like they're not being disrespectful to well, Jews by, by doing it. Well, I know. I, don't, I, I just want to make it clear that it's not a disrespect to Eden that the person was eating a ham and cheese sandwich there. I mean, seriously, that that's not really that. I'm not saying it for that reason. Yeah, it's not. It's not an issue at all. I'm just saying it was it was funny because we said it was the trifecta. <laughs> that's the only reason why I said it, because it was during Passover, too. But they they, um, they didn't care. So anyway, where's Rosemary? I thought you said she was coming in. That was Reverend Lynn. That was Reverend Lynn. Um, so we had, uh, yeah. So we had a uh, Easter that went right in, right after Passover. I mean, usually it's within a couple of days. It actually can be a month apart if the next lunar if, if the lunar calendar. Yeah. So I think it is the next year. So the lunar calendar, if it goes out of whack, because Easter is not tied to Passover. It's supposed to be. Kind of, but the way that the church did it. Hey, Reverend, there she is. It's Rosemary, Re Reverend Rosemary. Can so, somebody's got somebody's got to let Rosemary in. Can someone let her in? Thanks, thanks, Mike. Yeah, the, it's not locked. I don't know. It is for her. So, uh, so no. The way that Easter goes is it's the first Sunday after the full or over after the first full moon of spring, right? So normally speaking, spring starts in. March, March 20th. And if the, if that first full moon is, um, if it so happens that it's before Passover, then it goes back, then, then Passover will be when it is, and Easter won't be until after the 20th, you know, sometime after the 20th. Uh, Easter is always after March 20th. It has to be. There's no physical way that Easter can be earlier than March 20th. When's Passover next year? 22nd, 22nd, that's my birthday. Yeah, so that's why it happens. Like that. April. April. So, um, and we have the extra month, so it's so just the way it happens. Orthodox Easter is week later. Yeah, yeah, but it but but it's always around the same time as it's kind of almost based on when you guys do Easter, but Passover is based on the Jewish calendars, you know. The, the, the lunar months so it doesn't really it it it, it can happen i mean easter is always going to be when it is uh based on the sun and um the season passover is more based on the moon and um and it and it has that extra month so that the seasonal regression never happens yeah and that's why yom kippur i mean that's why all the holidays when they fall like Ramadan regresses 11 days every year, right? So every three years, Ramadan is a month earlier than it was. So every three years, like say, say Ramadan is in, was, well, this year it was in March and April. Next, in three years from now, it'll be in February and March. In three years after that, it'll be in January. So it's, it's regressing so that eventually Ramadan will be in the summer. And when it's in the summer for Muslims, that's not good. Because they got 20 hours, depending on where they live, they could have 20 hours of not eating. So when they're closer to the spring in the vernal um, or autumnal equinox, then it's 12 hours, 12 hours, roughly. Not when it's in the summer, when it's 18 hours the other direction. So it's, it's, um, it's uh, yeah, it can get tough. I guess on the, on, the, on the other side, if it's wintertime, then you get a pretty short fast time, too. So, next year, so in a few years, it'll be like that for Muslims. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I mean, Hanukkah this year coming up is the like the seventh, I think, or sixth or seventh, and then you know it, it's it's pretty early, and then next year it will be back to the back to the month after. When do we get the second the second month? How often we get the second Adar uh, seven years out of nineteen? Seven out of nineteen. So it's roughly every three years. It's a little under every three years. It's it's seven years out of out of. It's a nineteen year schedule. So every nineteen years, 
the schedule resets and then you have the I noticed this year, like my dad's birthday is very close to the same calendar. Every 19 years, your birthday, your Hebrew birthday and your English birthday align again every 19 years. So when you're 38, when you're 57, whatever, then your Hebrew date and your English, unless it's a leap year. And if it's a leap year, it'd be one day off. It'll be one day off. Seriously, that's the only caveat. Otherwise, uh, your birth date and Hebrew date line up every 19 years. I don't know what that's good for, but there you have it. No, look, you know, if you really follow the Hebrew calendar, like, you know, I guess kind of I do, it, it does make for weird stuff. Sometimes my birthday falls on Tisha B'Av. You know, people here complain my birthday came during Passover. You, I, my birthday could fall on a fast day. I can't even I can't even eat on my birthday sometimes. July 26th, same as your mom's. How could you forget that? No, I'm just Mine is always usually on Passover. Yeah, so... so I, Fine, so you can't have cake, but I can, sometimes can't eat for my birthday. True, yeah. I mean, you can have something. You can't have you can have chocolate, but um, but yeah. So mine's sometimes on a fast day. Eh, too bad. Um, I guess I have to follow it on the Hebrew calendar because my birthday is the first of Av, so it's never you know if I follow it on that day, but I don't. Don't trust me. I don't. Anyways. Um, so we're stalling for Rosemary. Rosemary's here now. She's live. I don't know. It's weird. Well, there's a lot of people live. There's there's seven there's seven people online. You guys are there. Uh, it's nice to see everybody. I will tell you this though. It's perfect timing to tell everybody this. Uh, several times in the next few weeks, we're only going to be live uh, online. I'm going to be out of town. Different places. All different places. What? Don't shake your head at me. No, I did. I mean, in different places. I mean, no, I'm going to be, I'm going to be, uh, I'm trying to, no, not Reno. I'm going to be in different places. That's funny. That was very good. That was very good. Robert. No, he's been in Tahoe. No, um, no, we're traveling for a few different things. Uh, a, a couple times to Arizona, one time to, I can't remember. Uh, I don't know. I have it, but, um, but the, but uh, Wednesdays will be here every, every Wednesday night, except for one, um, the the over the next couple of months, but um, through May. But I guess that's just the way the way we had our stuff. But I'm looking at how many more uh, sessions we have of Isaiah, and I computed that we we have roughly probably four four or five more sessions as we go through Isaiah. Um, is that me? No, it's not me. I don't have my phone in here. So, oh, maybe I do. Sorry. Um, it's in the other room. It's the sun um, from uh, Monday, Thursday through Easter. Um, they have all of the second Isaiah readings. I mean, that was. Oh, yeah. Wonderful. Yeah, yeah. So, how was it this year reading uh, the Isaiah as you're reading it well, more in depth? <laughs> oh, you did? Okay. Well, actually, let me show you one thing um, because you might appreciate this. And I did bring it today. Which is the the really great commentary I think on Isaiah was done probably now about thirty years ago. It's the Anchor Bible, and it was done uh, okay. no twenty years ago. Uh, Joseph Blenkinsop did the Isaiahs, and he did them in three sections. He did first Isaiah one through thirty nine was one volume, forty through fifty five, and then. 56 through uh, 66. But the, these are commentaries uh, and translations. And, and uh, Blank, Blankensop was the um, professor of OT, of Old Testament, at uh, Notre Dame for many years. So Sheldon's from, some from South Bend. So, um, but he was there for many years. He just died last year. He was 94. Uh, he was retired for a few years, but he, um, probably about 15 years, but he, um, before he retired, um, he did this. And uh, again, the anchor Bibles were all done by different people. Um, uh, they're really highly regarded. And they did, they did a version of them back in the, I want to say back in the 60s and 70s. And then in uh, about 90 or so, they decided to go back and redo them because they had, had so much new uh, study and stuff that had been done because the um, Dead Sea Scrolls and so many great things. Um, Blenkinsop was actually born in England, but he was in America for many, many years. Um, he taught 
from 1970 to I think about 2005 or something at Notre Dame. Um, but uh, the guy who edited it, it was one of my other professors, David Noel Friedman. There was Richard Friedman and David Noel Friedman. David Noel Friedman was the editor. So he got to choose who, who would be uh, doing each volume. And so he got to assemble an all-star cast and he basically took people who were the best at this, best at you know numbers, the best at, at Isaiah, the best at Proverbs. And he basically had them, he or she, a lot of he's um, in those days, did the volumes. And this one is, uh, the one for Isaiah, I think were exceptionally good. And, uh, and you know, some of them are, I think are better than others. Some of them are... Um, get really, really um, into the weeds. But this one, I think, has some really good ideas in it. And I, I, you know, I agree with a lot of the stuff in here. It's interesting because he writes about some of the stuff we're going to get into, especially the suffering servant, which a lot of people saw as Jesus. And, you know, he kind of looks at it from the, the standpoint of like, what is it really saying? Not like trying to make sure that it fits to what, you know, uh, that it fits to Jesus. But he um, he's a really great uh, scholar and um, and um, yeah he was you know he, he he did a lot of great work over the years so uh, if you're interested in Isaiah and and, and digging deeper um, this is a really good translation and and I've been looking I was looking at it a little bit over the over the last couple of weeks because um, you know people have been asking really good questions about some of the uh, some of the the, the references and you know, what is it, what, you know, what do we think it really means? Um, he, he's really kind of straightforward on it. And, um, and so, you know, if, if we get to some stuff today, I'll share it with you. So um, last week, uh, Rosemary was, was taking us through, we started reading about uh, an Isaiah, he started referring directly to Cyrus, to King Cyrus, King Koresh, which I mentioned to you was kind of weird, because I was just watching the Waco, Texas thing. And uh, David Koresh took his name from King David and King Cyrus, the two messiahs, the Jewish messiah and the Gentile messiah. So he purposely called him, and he changed his name. I can't remember what his name was when he was his birth name, but he changed his name to David Koresh. Uh, so he'd have both messiahs there. Um, as we said, it says flat out right here. Uh, Thus the Lord said to Cyrus, his anointed one, his messiah. It says that. So the Bible calls Cyrus the messiah. So when people say, well, is every Messiah... Vernon Wayne Howell. There you go. Vernon, not like David Koresh. Does not sound like David Koresh. Mm -hmm. So uh, it was a... Um, it, it, it's a fact that other people are called the Messiah who, number one, are not Jewish. And number two, we would uh, say Persian guy who doesn't worship God, who doesn't pray to God, who eats whatever he wants, who has relations with whoever he wants, is the Messiah. Okay. This is crucial right now and super hyper relevant. I just want to tell you why. Um, and I don't want to get political, and I'm not going to get political, but I'm going to tell you that this is very, very relevant today. Because... There is a teaching that goes on in the uh, primarily in the fundamentalist uh, churches today. And the questions asked uh, legitimately, I think, again, not being political. How do you, evangelical Christians, how do fundamentalist Christians, how do Bible believing Christians, people trying to live by a, a morality and, and a biblical injected truth, if you will? How do they back a person as president who is completely devoid of morality? They've been asked by their congress. They've been asked by fellow ministers. How do you do that? How do you stomach somebody who's a serial philanderer, who, whose defense about having affairs with people is not that I didn't have an affair with them, but I would never have an affair with that woman. She's too ugly. I mean, that, that, this really happened. So how do people who are evangelical Christians back that, right? How do they stomach that? I've had discussions with ministers from this community over this issue. Evangelical, fundamentalist, biggest churches in Santa Clarita. I'm not going to give their names, and it's not, it, you can figure it out, and you can do your, 
mind, you know, work your mind on this. We talk about this. How do you do that? How do you wrap your head around that truth? How do you, how do you, how do you do that? Right? Well, they have an answer, Doreen. They have an answer. This line right here. Thus said the Lord to Cyrus, his anointed one. God can work through someone who holds a Bible upside down and has no idea what's in the Bible, who does not go to church, who fully admits, I have no desire to go to church on Easter. Last week, five days ago, no desire to go to church, not even pretending to go to church. Walked out at mar lago and started screaming at people that he's like Jesus. Or that I pray for the people who are persecuting me. So how do you do that? How do you do How do you rectify it? Because God can do that. How does God do that? Because God anointed Cyrus. Donald Trump is Cyrus in their minds. 100%. So if you want to understand how do you do that, and I'm not saying it's right or wrong, and this is where, again, I'm not going to, it's not going to be political because this is not, this is, if you decide that something works for you, you will rationalize it and you will make it work. And so it is an answer. Do you like that answer? I don't know. I don't, it doesn't, I'm not telling you it's an answer that should be your answer or that I'm telling you, but that's an answer. How can God do it? God does it. God did it. God can do it again. God can work through people who are completely, completely living a life that is against the biblical morality. He did it with Cyrus. And that's the only time in the, in the whole story that he does that? Yeah, but, but who cares? Well, no, it's been done. Once it's been done, you have a precedence for it. It can be done. If Cyrus can be the Messiah, so can he. And I, I was told that at egg plantation down the street. So it's not like I'm theoretically telling you this. I've heard it. I've read it. I know that people have said it. It was said to me sitting across the table. So people have, this is relevant for people because this is actually happening right now. So just understand that, that when people look at the Bible and they look at a line and you say, well, wh wh where, where does Isaiah chapter 45 come in people's minds? Is it in a prayer? Is it a, is it in a reference? Is it, did someone put it on a wall? It's deeper than that. People live this. People have wrapped their life around this. They've wrapped their hopes. They've wrapped their beliefs. They've wrapped their politics. They've wrapped a whole lot of their heart around this and they and they they live it it's much more important than any motto that you'd see on a on a bumper sticker so um if a person um believes that they can get in front of a community and say it they can influence a lot of people and so it is it's done but i want you to know that this is where this come this this mentality comes from this idea comes from is this again for some people it don't matter for other people i don't care it doesn't matter. I don't need a president who lives by biblical values for me. It's not important. It's fine. That's not what we're talking about. We're talking about people who, who, who will say this and who say that. And what happened? If a president delivers your religious platform, if he delivers you the Supreme Court, who cares what he does? I, I didn't say that, but Reverend Lynn said it. But for people who deliver on the biblical promises, that's what was told to me. Wow. And he's doing exactly what Cyrus did, which is a restoring Jerusalem to its prominence. Now, what's interesting about Isaiah is that Isaiah seems to, and at least this is one of the things that Blechensop says, he says that Isaiah and other Jews got frustrated with Cyrus. And he let them down because he didn't deliver fully on what they were hoping for. So that's possible. That's possible. And that does happen too. But we're, that's more of like, why does, why does Cyrus kind of not figure in? Like, why does, the, why does it seem as though, like within a few chapters, Cyrus is not the Messiah? Um, but I, I mean, look at it. 
Thus said the Lord of Cyrus, his, his anointed one. It's not my anointed one. It's not, Isaiah didn't say that he's our anointed one. He says he's his anointed one. Lim Shicho means his anointed one with a capital H. Um, chapter 45. Yeah. Specifically, how does that correspond to Cyrus in terms of tongue? So, so we're, we're going to see today, one of the reasons that we kind of look at the time on this is, is it is important because Cyrus, when he was first kind of coming to power, he had to put down a Babylonian revolution. The Babylonians um, who he conquered, you know, got a little bit more power. They were like, we're the Babylonians. You can't sit over us. And they started fighting against the Persians. Um, that happened. We know the dates that that happened. So we know that that's about 508. Like we know when that happened. Guess what? Isaiah talks about it right now. We're going to see Isaiah talk about it right now. So um, that fits into the prophecies and that fits into the agenda. And needless to say, we like Cyrus. We don't like the Babylonians. So you're going to see this right now. Um, I think we left off. Where did we leave off, Rosemary? Do you remember? Uh, I think we're right about here. Yeah, I think we're right about here. So uh, big hopes for Cyrus. He, he, he seems to be really powerful. He seems to be really aligned with... Uh... Oh, and by the way, we know a lot about Cyrus because we have some of the Persian records. We have the Bible, but we also have this guy named Herodotus. You've heard of him before. He was a Greek writer. He was wrote he wrote Greek histories, but he also wrote histories very importantly about the Persians. Now, some people think that Herodotus lied about a lot of stuff and he like didn't really know this stuff. By the way, he was from uh, Turkey or modern what we call Turkey today, Halicarnassus, which is which was a, a Greek city in in uh, Asia Minor. But he lived right on the border between the Persian uh, Empire and the Greeks. When the Greeks and the Persians were fighting over the Aegean, he lived in that area. And, uh, and so he wrote about Persians for the Greek audience. And so that's how we know a lot about uh, Cyrus and the Persian kings during this time was from this. So a lot of irony here, uh, historical irony. I don't say coincidence. I literally mean irony because the, the Persians are our biggest enemies today. Iran, um, they, are, they are number one on the list of, of enemies, at least of Israel, but Definitely seem to be pretty high on the list of enemies of the United States, too. So that's ironic. I mean, that's not coincidental because they were our friends and now they're not. And um, it's flipped in a little way in the sense that I don't want to say we're like the Greeks, the Americans, but well, if you watch the movie 300, 100%, that's what that was supposed to be. That's a Frank Miller imagination that we're fighting the Muslims and the invaders from the East. I, I didn't make that up, by the way. That's really well known that the movie 300 was a, was a came out while we were fighting the Afghanis, the Iraqis, somebody else too, probably. Um, yeah, that was part of the, the myth of, of uh, white Europeans uh, defending against the onslaught of Asia. But uh, yeah, that's that's uh, we were on the the Jews were on the the side of the Asians at that time. Now we're on the other side. We're on the European side. I have a quick question. Yes, is Cyrus <laughs> as it goes on and on becomes less and less of what he promised to be? Does that not play into it as well? Uh, who knows? We 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 don't know. I think there will be some. I think I think I think no, but I think I no, Doreen. I think it's there's a fair question of whether of whether people will, whether people how that plays out, and and people will tend to probably make the narrative fit. Yeah. But but you know you can you can use the Bible in lots of interesting ways. If you're a clever person and you want to believe something, you can find evidence. You can find it in the Bible. I want to find evidence to help him disbelieve. Well, <laughs> look, I mean, you, read, read, look, read Isaiah, read, read, read what happens and, and read more, if you'd like, read more about Isaiah. If you read more about him, read more about him on your own. It's an interesting history. And he was an important king and the, and the Persians ended up 
being pretty important, pretty powerful. I mean, if it wasn't for the Greeks, who knows how far the Persian Empire would have gone? I mean, look, I we're 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 a little we're a little um, you know we're 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 dependent on European Western civilization. So in our take, you know, the Battle of Thermopylae and the the Battle of Marathon, you know, stopped the stopped the world from becoming, uh, you know, like that. I don't know. It's weird. But that was our world. I mean, the weird thing is, is that world of the Persians was much more the Jewish world than it was the Greek world. I mean, at that time, just, I, I, I just, you know, that is the truth though. When, 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 when Xerxes and those Kings were fighting the Greeks at the, at the, where the battle of the 300 took place, Thermopylae, if there were Jews fighting, they were on the Persian side. They weren't on the Greek side. I mean, that's just a fact. It's more likely that Persian Jews were fighting for Persia because they like Persia. We like Persia. So figure that out. All right, so let's take a look at uh, Isaiah 45. Rosemary, you want to read? I will read. Are people going to be able to hear Do you have your book? Yeah, we'll get you a book. Let's get, let's get Rosemary a book right in front of her. Uh, yeah, we got to get her the mic. I'm going to get her the Can you do that, Mike? Yeah. Mike's going to get the mic. So I think, I think we can get her all loaded up. So, uh, yeah, Isaiah, Isaiah, um, Isaiah's, or again, second Isaiah, this is where, again, we, I mentioned this last week. Uh, and by the way, this uh, previous line uh, from 44 was probably written by the same, this, that's another thing that Bleck, Bleckensop does is he actually shows where the sections are in here because they really don't go by chapter and verse. You know, there, there'll be, you know, the, 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 the sections, the prophetic sections might be 10 or 11 verses and he groups them by the prophecy. And sometimes they go over a chapter into another chapter or they're just a few lines from one chapter and specific, you know, specifically. There's a question about time. About what year? So when, when is Cyrus alive and when is this written? Okay, so, so um, well, we're going to see the Babylonian prophecies today as soon as we get to in chapter 47. But um, I'll show you, I'll show you, uh, I'll show you um, Cyrus's lifespan. Um, so... Um, okay, take your, all right, so um, here is, I'm going to show you the, the dynasty. So Just a test? Well, yep, it's working. You got it. So let's take a look. Let me just show you the, uh, the kings. Let me just show you the kings. And again, these kings Insane. are these kings are Zoroastrian. Okay, they're Zoroastrian, so they believe in um, they believe in Zoro. They don't believe in Zoro. So <laughs> they believe in Ahura Mazda. They have a they have a dualistic uh, they have a dualistic uh, view of things that there's a light side and a dark side, kind of like the Force, much more like. Star Wars. So here's Cyrus. Uh, 530 is when his uh, 530 BC. So he's 560 to 530. Isaiah is, uh, second Isaiah seems to be from about 550 to 520. That was about 100 years after the first Isaiah? No, uh, probably 75, 80 years. 75, 80 years after first Isaiah. The first Isaiah, no, no. Uh, no, it's a hundred. Yeah, it's about a hundred years after. You're right. It's a hundred and I first Isaiah is about seven hundred. So yeah, it's about one hundred fifty years. Uh, it's uh, it's sixty years after the first temple was destroyed by um, by Nebuchadnezzar. And here's the kings. So here's Cyrus, Cambyses, who's only for a short time, uh, Bardia, who 
I think, killed him, who's even shorter. He, uh, Darius I kills him, and Darius reigns for a long time. So Darius is for about 30-something years. And then you have Xerxes, Artaxerxes, and then Xerxes II. These guys are all important because this is the time of uh, King Ahasuerus. This is also the time of, of um, the Battle of Thermopylae and, and, the, and the wars against the Greeks. But Cyrus is the founder of this dynasty. And uh, the dynasty, as you see, starts in about 550 and goes to 330. Uh, Darius III is the one who loses to Alexander the Great. So, so the Persian dynasty, and why is it important, this Achaemenid dynasty, they're the ones who destroy the Babylonians, and they reign all the way from Babylonians to the Greeks. And that's a 200-some year period, one of the best periods for the Jewish people ever. It's one of the few periods of the, the Jews are left alone. They can build their little temple. They have a little temple this time, we, the second temple. They have, uh, they, they're left alone. They don't have any wars. Nobody's bothering them. They don't have to choose sides. The Persians have a very good administration. We have to pay them you know, taxes, and we have to recognize their sovereignty, but no problems. We know nothing about this period. There's nothing. We have nothing. We have some uh, texts from Josephus about the period. The rabbis have some tiny little references to this period, but very little. We don't know anything about it. We don't know what was going on. So we're back in Jerusalem. Some, some of us, some of us. but some of us are living in Persia. We're allowed to come back. But some of us are living in Persia. Why? Because these people right here, Xerxes is the Hashverosh. This is a Hashverosh. And guess what? Esther and her and her uncle slash cousin slash husband, they live in Persia. They live in Shushan. They live in Susa, one of the capitals. So th this is this is the period of time. So, so this is probably written about 530, 538, 540 is when Isaiah, second Isaiah is talking about it. And he's specifically talking about this stuff. So I'll show you one thing. Um uh Cyrus, they they had a uh well they had several rebellions, uh people that were rebelling against them. Um and the Babylonians, the Babylonian uh rebellion, serious Herodotus's history, he writes about Cyrus the Great. Um uh, I'm gonna see where I hear if it talks about the the uh Babylonian re rebellion against them. Uh, but, you know, look, the reason that the Babylonians were rebelling against them is that this dude put, the, put them down. These, this guy put them down. Now, the, um, let me just see if it says what year the, the Babylonian rebellion was. Um, the Babylonians worship different gods. So, so uh, the Babylonians, like uh, Nebuchadnezzar and his family, they worshiped God Bel, God Marduk. Ashtar, they 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 have Ishtar, you know, call her Ishtar. They worship these goddesses, gods and goddesses. They they were inheritors of the of the of the Mesopotamian religions. The Zoroastrian religion was not like those religions. Um, they they were much more. Um, they had a different philosophy. They had the 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 Gnostic style we call now the Gnostic style dualism of the Zoroastrians were. A little bit closer to us in the sense that, that you know there was a there was a chief god who was powerful, uh, and uh, and 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 this is important because you'll see it in Isaiah, you'll see it in our text, you'll see it in our you'll see it. The Zoroastrian influence lasted a long time. Um, I'll tell you the the uh, um. Oh, it, it was consistent. It was it was constant. Um, so, five thirty nine was the five thirty nine was the revolt against uh, Babylon, the Babylonian revolt against the Persians. Um, and we think that again, this is roughly the time when um, when uh, when Isaiah is writing, or the second Isaiah is writing, right? So, let's take a look at. The text and um, um, 
Well, I'll point it out when we get to it. But but it's very clear what's going on here. I mean, you'll uh, I'll, I'll, when I tell you a couple of things, it'll be very clear what's happening here. All right. So, Rosemary, take it away. Thus said the Lord to Cyrus, his anointed one, whose right hand he has grasped, treading down nations before him, ungirding the loins of kings, opening doors before him, and letting no gate stay shut. Yeah, pretty much. Uh, he can do anything he wants because he's chosen by God and God's letting him conquer everybody. I will march before you and level the hills that loom up. I will shatter doors of bronze and cut down iron barbs. I will give you treasures concealed in the dark and secret hordes so that you may know that it is I, the Lord, the God of Israel, who call you by name. For the sake of my servant Jacob, Israel, my chosen one, I call you by name. I hail you by title, though you have not known me. So it says right there that, you know, Cyrus doesn't really, you know, he doesn't really worship God. You don't know me. But I've chosen you. And I've chosen you because of the Jews. Jacob and Israel are my people. And because they're my people, you're going to take care of my people, and you're going to be my king. I am the Lord, and there is none else. Beside me, there is no God. I engird you, though you have not known me, so that they may know from east to west that there is none but me. I am the Lord, and there is none else. Read the I next one. Form light and create darkness. I make will and create woe. I, the Lord, do all these things. So let's take a look at that line. Because very clearly, it's saying that Cyrus, even though he doesn't get it, is part of my plan. Guess what? That also shows you, it don't matter whether the person that's been chosen by God gets it, he's part of the plan. He doesn't have to recognize God. Cyrus didn't. It kind of refutes Zoroastrianism right there. Oh, and they, you jumped it, but yes, right there. Where is it, Rosemary? I form light and create darkness. I make well and create woe. One God does all those things. Correct. And that's the anti-Zoroastrian line. And basically saying, even though you're Zoroastrian, even though I know you believe in the light and darkness, it's all BS. What is well? What does that mean? It's like... Well-being. Uh, oh. Yeah, it's good stuff. Okay. All they're doing there with the weird wheel, what's your translation there, well, Reverend Lynn? Well, yeah, it says woe and wheel. Oh, it does? Yeah. King James too? Woe and wheel? Yeah. Yeah. They tried to do something here, uh, which is create some poetics, you know, uh, in English. Is the Hebrew alert? Okay. Well, let's look at it. Osei shalom uvore ra. Right? No. But Osei and Vore are, are more uh, paralleled. But this is super important because, number one, it's the theology, as Rosemary pointed out. It's like, yeah, we know you worship the God of light and the God of darkness, that they're two gods. There aren't two gods. There's only one God. It's all me. Super important. This is the basis for anti-Zoroastrianism. It's also really the first time in, in the scriptures that God is the only God. God. Yeah. The only, the God. only God. Yeah. Right. It's not until Isaiah that we get this. And that's why some people point out that Isaiah, look, part of the polemic was the Jews aren't really that much older than Christians because it's not until Isaiah, second Isaiah even, in the 500s that you get this kind of light, which means that Christianity is only 500 years newer than the, the monotheism of, of this is only 500 years before Jesus. I, like, I don't get that. I mean, I don't, I, who cares? You're, you're, but that was part of the, de the the decision to like focus on that to some, for some people was, was considered an anti-Jewish polemic because it was basically saying they weren't really monotheistic during the time of Abraham. So don't date Judaism, don't date monotheism and Judaism back to Abraham and Isaac and Jacob. You really only can do it from, from Isaiah where you start to see this. Possible, I'm not 100% sure. People who've 
kind of looked at the rest of, of the earlier parts of the Bible. Look, the earliest places that we'll say, like maybe parts of the Bible are from like the Song of the Sea, which we think is one of the oldest texts. That doesn't seem to be as monotheistic. Um, and so like the words, Micha Mocha by Elim Adonai, who like you among all the deities, amongst all the gods, that seems to imply there are other gods. But so the, the, it's it's partly because of that, but it also could have been poetic. I mean, it, it's difficult to know, and it's difficult to know if that author was the only author saying those kinds of things. So it's difficult for people to make those judgments of what when monotheism really was what we know it as monotheism, which is there's only one God. There isn't a best God, but the only God. Here, it's clear. It's the only God. But it is very much against the polemic, against the backdrop of Zoroastrianism, against well, there's a light God and a dark God. And there's only one God. So, Zoroastrianism pushed or forced. Correct. And it forced people to actually articulate it. But to some extent then, and again, I don't want to simplify it, by having two gods, and Zoroastrianism had more than two gods as well in a way, but but by having two main forces, it it, it allows Judaism to say, no, there's not two, there's one. Whereas before there was like a hundred and you're really like, well, is there only one or, or, or is, does that God control the other gods? We don't really know, but it could be that they just always believe there was one God. Well, that's part of the theory that God is the Godhead. It's the, it's, it's the gods. That's the theory. The but, 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 well, but the problem is, is that the verbs that are used are all singular verbs and everybody knew that. So it's difficult for people to say that. So it does seem to me, to me, that at the beginning of Genesis, God is by himself. The plural, and even when God says, let us make man, the fact is, is that it says that God made man. It doesn't say the gods made man. So yeah, and, and whether if God's talking to angels or God's talking to other heavenly beings, they're still subservient to God. So I don't know. Look, I, you know, people get, they get really bent out of shape about that. I don't know. I mean, what difference does it make? We know that our ancestors were worshiping idols anyway. So what difference does it make? They were sacrificing other yeah. gods, which is why Elijah and everybody else is, is going nuts in the, in the ninth, eighth and ninth century. So, I mean, the archaeology tells us that. So whether or not they were supposed to be worshiping one God, they weren't. We know that. The rabbi said that. I mean, it's, it's there. It's, it's obvious. Anyways, this line, though, is super, super important. Correct. Clear. And by the way, do the Ten Commandments reflect, you shall have no other gods besides me? Or is it saying that because there's only one God or because God's saying, I'm the only God you can worship? You, those people can worship their gods, but you're only worshiping me. Again, it's difficult to, to make that argument. But I want you to focus on this. This Hebrew line, Yotzer Or Vore Choshech, Osei Shalom Vore, that's the Yotzer Or prayer. That's the morning prayer we say every day. Baruch HaTar Nailehim, Melech HaLam, Yotzer Or Vore Choshech, Choshech, Osei Shalom Vore. That says Uvore Ra. We don't say that. We say Uvore Etakol. Because the rabbis who wrote the prayer didn't like this. Now, the polemic is definitely against. Gnosticism against against Gnostic dualism, right? Because it says God makes light, creates darkness. Those same words, Yodser and Vore. Here it's Ose and Vore. Those are all three words that we use for creating. Yodser is formed or create. Uh, Ose is to make or to do, and Vore is also to create. Reshit bara Elohim, at the beginning God created, we use the word bara. Anyways, are all three synonyms for creating but the point is is that and we have four i mean there, there's four words one of them is repeated twice yotzer vore ose and vore is used again but what what's the parallel here and it's very obvious i'm just saying it's or right light and shalom good hoshech and darkness that's clearly against zoroastrianism there's no question that that's why it's parallel like that the issue is the rabbis didn't like that God made evil. Did, did we? Uh, Your when, translation, when was the Yotze, Mary, is makes When was the Yotze Or prayer um, developed? Was it around this time, uh, time, or is it because of this too? That's what the word raw means. It means bad. Ah. Okay. Right? Yeah. 
That's what ara, that the word ra means bad. Correct. But people didn't like that God made evil. They don't like that. They don't want to say that. They don't want to say that every morning. God made evil? God made evil? Wait, I can't say that. Isaiah said, <laughs> live, I know. God, God said, God said, I make, well, at least Isaiah says that God said, I form light, create darkness, I make good, I make peace, and I make bad. So, again, woe, but woe is a terrible translation. Wheel and woe are terrible translations. Whoever translated the word wheel for shalom, show me where else it says wheel for the word shalom. Shalom is used a lot in the Bible. How would you know? It means aloha. No, it doesn't mean aloha. What? Correct. 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 Look, they were saying it because God makes everything and God makes, there is no force for evil. There is no evil force. There's God. Don't say it. Don't say devil. Don't devil. So this is the problem. This, this line is clearly undermining those who want to believe in dualism, which, by the way, there were probably Jews who were being affected by it. How do we know? Because we start to see it. We start to see Jews talking about the forces of evil. That humans have the inclination both ways. It seems to me. Seems to me the rabbis felt that they did, they did, because but they don't like this idea that God creates it from the standpoint of why does God? Then you have to say, then why did God create evil? Yeah, well, that's why the, God creates those choices, right? God creates those possibilities, but some people didn't like, and they don't want to have it articulated like that. So, Ose Shalom Takol is what we say today. We say everything, right? So it covers that. It covers it, but it also allows. So when people say, "The rap, can we change our prayers today? Like, can we can we add the mothers to the prayer?" So, well, the rabbis added the word "coal" instead of "raw." They knew exactly what they did. Everybody knows where they got that prayer from. They know where we call it the Yotzer Or prayer, the prayer over creation of light. We don't say it's the creation of light and the creation of darkness, but that's what it's traditionally said. We said we have the Mari Varavim prayer at night. Right after the Baruch This is right after the Baruch in the morning. We say the words, thank you, God, for creating light and creating darkness, for making peace. And every time I say, Yotzer, you know, when I when it says Yotzer, I say, say Shalom, Vareta Kol. I mean, you mean, Ovareta Ra, that God created the Ra? That's what it says. So they knew, the rabbis knew what they were doing. They just didn't want to have people say it. They made them feel uncomfortable. It, 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 it goosed them a little bit. And it does. If you say it as a prayer, it kind of like, yeah. Wait a second, our God makes evil? So the last line is, I, the Lord, do all these things, right? Adonai ose kol ele. Now, it doesn't say ose et hakol. It says ose kol ele. I do these things. The word ele is things. I do this stuff. So ose et hakol is really just flipping that, taking this part out. Ra and then adding Ose et hakol. So it's not ter it's not like a terrible, you know, uh, uh edit, but it is it is it is this great line. And what's so great about it is that we don't even understand how culturally important it was at that moment for Isaiah to tell the people the Zoroastrian stuff is not you either. Don't try to make God into a Zoroastrian equivalent either. Our God does everything. So super important line in Isaiah um, because it set the terms. And by the way, when this dynasty ends with, with, um, with uh, Alexander the Great, right? When Alexander beats Darius, he, he beats him. I mean, they, they, they're wiped out. That's not the end of the Persian Empire. There's a new Persian Empire that takes over. And they rule for... 800 more years. The Sasanian dynasty, much more powerful. Yes, and treated very well by the Sasanians. That's when the Talmud was developed. So after the Greco-Roman period, because for a while it's controlled by Alexander, and then he dies and his generals can't really keep that part of the empire, becomes uh, the Parthian kingdom, and then it becomes the Sasanian dynasty. And those people are finally destroyed by the Muslims. The Muslims destroy the Sasanian dynasty. But those Sasanians are Zoroastrian too. 
they worship Ahura Mazda and the, and the Zoroastrian gods that whole period. It has a huge effect on Jews because they're living under that period for, for hundreds and hundreds of years. Hundreds and hundreds of years. So it had an effect on us. Um, and their traditions had an effect on us. The Zoroastrian traditions had an effect on us. Guess what? We have a holiday called Purim. This was invented by, by Jews to be a way for us to celebrate the, the Zoroastrian New Year, the Sasanian New Year, called Noruz. It's the Persian New Year. It was a way for Jews to celebrate Noruz. 100%. Drink, have a good time, send gifts, exactly what the Persians did. Ironically, the Persians can't really officially drink. They still do, but they're not supposed to drink under the Islamic uh, regime that they're under, the fundamentalist regime that they're under. But uh, they used to party on Nowruz. Jews still do. It's called Purim. But uh, yeah, they had an effect on us. They had to, because we lived there in peace, in peace for most of for most of the last two thousand years. What are you going to do? But uh, uh, this. This uh, was put an end to by the Muslims. They, they persecuted the Zoroastrians and still do. There are very few Zoroastrians left in Iran. I will tell you that when this was written, when, when Isaiah wrote this, or when it was written 2,500 years ago, no one would have thought Jews would still be alive and the Zoroastrians would be 100,000 people. Never. In a billion, million years, you could have gone around and talked to every Jew and every Zoroastrian, they would have laughed at you. They would have said, are you kidding me? The Zoroastrians are an empire. There's a king. He's the king of kings. The Shah of Shah, they called him. Shah and Shah. That's what the word was for a king in, in Persia. Are you kidding me? The Jews are going to be more powerful than the Zoroastrians. First, the Jews are more powerful than anybody. They're not going to be more powerful than the Zoroastrians. 2,000 years from now, there's going to be 100,000 Zoroastrians, and they're basically going to be left in India. Yeah. They're all underground. You can't, you can't find Zoroastrians. <clears throat> they don't like them. But you know who liked them? The Shah. <laughs> he loved Cyrus. He used, the, he used the symbols of the Zoroastrians. He had parties. He had big Noruz parties, big alcohol parties. He didn't care. No, nah, he loved Cyrus. He was, but he was also, he loved Persian history. He loved the Persian culture. And, and when this regime falls, and I guarantee you it's going to fall, they're going to go back to this. And you know what's going to happen? I'm telling you this right now. I don't know if we'll live to see it, but it's going to happen. There's going to be a neo-Zoroastrian renaissance in Persia, in Iran. And there's going to be people going back to medieval Zoroastrianism. Because they're going to be so pissed at what happened over the last 50 years. They're going to go back to, they're going to do stuff that's going to blow your mind. Because when they, when they tear off this regime, they're going to rip it off. And I'm telling you, you're going to see crazy stuff go on there. So there are. Oh, they're there. They just can't. Oh, the more that they try to push it down, the more it's going to just bubble up and explode. I'm telling you, it may not happen in our lifetime, but I think it will. Because I think it could happen five years from now. It could happen next year. When this regime, when there's a kink, in, a little chink in the arm, a little kink, whatever, when that thing explodes through, oh, it's going to be crazy. It's always true. It's always true. But we're going to see it happen. And I don't know what's going to happen. I mean, it could be crazy. But uh, I, hope, I hope to live to see it. I mean, I don't want to see crazy stuff go on there. But I tell you one thing. I want to walk in that country. You're not saying that. Oh, I dream about, I dream about being able to walk through these places like Susa, like Shushan. I, I, that's the one country. If I, can, I don't care. No, that country, Iran. Yeah, I would love to go to Iran. I'd love to see Ekbatan. I'd love to see these places, Persepolis. I would love to go back and see that. And I hope they. And I hope what they do when they do this is they build, rebuild these palaces. I'd love to see those palaces. The, the Shah was was going to do that, wasn't he? He was going to do it. He was going to do it. But that just, you know, look. I'm telling you, it's going to happen. There's going to be a re, there's going to be a return to it, and that's what's going to happen. And Zoroastrians are going to have a resurgence, a resurgence in that country. It'll be probably. Zoro will be the king. <laughs> <laughs> so still, well, 
lots of Parsis in India, right? Well, I was going to say that, Rosemary. Who's the last Zoroastrian that you know? Well, actually, Zubin Mehta is a uh, Zoroastrian. He's Parsi. Yeah. He's Parsi. He's still alive. Yeah, he was from, he was born in India, but he was uh, Parsi. He was from the Zoroastrian community. Come on, give me the most famous Parsi you know. Uh, you know, he wasn't born in, in India, but he was born to Indian parents. It was in the movie. Didn't see it. It was in this movie about him that came out a couple of years ago. Freddie he Mercury. Parsi. He was born in Zanzibar. No, he's dead now. Freddie Mercury. Zoroastrian. He was Parsi. Yep. He was a Zoroastrian. He had the Ahura Mazda. Yeah. Oh, yeah. Yep. Yep. He's Zoroastrian. He's, he's a Parsi. He's, an, he's a, originally from Persia. His family moved to India hundreds of years ago, and they escaped the... Uh, the Muslim, uh, the Muslim persecution, and guess what? Zoroastrian. Interesting, right? So not many, but the notion of demigods. Yeah, Zoroastrianism. Their their uh, the, the creator of dark and the creator of light are equal. Yeah. So one is not a demigod. No, no, but. Uh, there's interesting, you know, again, what we've reconstructed and what we know about Zoroastrianism from this period might be more, again, um, a little bit more, well, the later, the later teachings of Zoroastrianism, the later kind of like neo-Zoroastrianism -Zoro seem to be a little bit more influenced by uh, monotheism and Christianity and tried to kind of like fit more with that discussion. But, you know, interestingly, I think in the, in the original kinds of forms of Zoroastrianism, you really had, look, people didn't, for the most part, worship the, the forces of darkness, but they understood that those were powerful forces and ones that they offered things to and, 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 and acknowledged. And again, you didn't want to worship the forces of darkness, but you understood that those forces existed and were part of, the, uh, were part of creation that were equally balanced to some extent. So... Uh, light was a very important uh, factor for these people. They lit candles and they lit fires all over the place, our Astrians. The, the, the Muslim sources call them fire worshipers because you know they were kind of making, them, making fun of them that they worship fire. But fire was a representation of light, was a repre representation of God, of goodness. So for the most part, again, they understood that, you know, at least later on, that they were on the right side, that they were on the forces of light, but they lit candles all over the place. The Paisley pattern derives from Paisley. Yep, is is the Zoroastrian style. Uh, most importantly for us, there are references and and layers of Zoroastrianism that are part of Judaism that we don't even think about. And you know what? One of them is lighting Shabbos candles, lighting Hanukkah candles, lighting candles at every one of our holidays. Zoroastrians were lighting candles all the time. It's not in the Torah, folks. It's in, the only thing you light is the menorah. When we start lighting candles in our houses for the holidays, that's Zoroastrianism, folks. The thing also with Zoroastrianism that the concept influenced a religion called Abrahamic religions. No, that's us. That's Christianity, Judaism, and Islam. Yes, it influenced us. Really? Yes, it influenced Abrahamic religions because. Our whole belief of a heaven and hell, that's from Zoroastrianism. But not everything from you. <laughs> no, we, well, we got it from them. So yes, you, yes, it came in through, but it came into Judaism. This whole idea of a force of light versus a force of darkness comes from Zoroastrianism. Also got affected by this crossroads of Persia. It's a huge, it's a huge part of our history that we don't know of world history. And, and the effect of it is, is enormous. Zarathustra. Yeah. Zarathustra. Zarathustra. So the, the Zoroaster is the uh, Greek corruption of his, of his name. Super important uh, religion that we don't know anything about anymore. So, uh, and this is a polemic against it. 
which we don't even understand because if we didn't understand what they believed, we wouldn't understand that this is a this is a whole knock on on them. Yep. All right. So let's read a little bit more. We've only read seven lines. All right, keep going. <laughs> Pour down, O skies, from above. Let the heavens rain down victory. Let the earth open up and triumph sprout. Yes, let vindication spring up. I, the Lord, have created it. Shame on him who argues with his maker, though not but a potsherd of earth. Shall the clay say to the potter, what are you doing? Your work has no handles. Shame on him who asks his father, what are you begetting for a woman? What are you bearing? Thus said the Lord, Israel's holy one and maker, will you question me on the destiny of my children? Will you instruct me about the work of my hands? It was I who made the earth and created man upon it. My own hands stretched out the heavens and I marshaled all their host. It was I who roused him for victory and who level all roads for him. He shall rebuild my city and let my exiled people go without price and without payment, said the Lord of hosts. Now that seems to be the end of that prophecy. How do we know? Because it says, so the Lord of hosts. So it's pretty much, that's a good place to end it. And again, where Black and Sop says, hey, look, you know, this is a great place. to." But it's a beautiful prophecy. I mean, it's a beautiful section. Uh, and again, it, it goes it goes back to the, we didn't stop there, but it goes back to the um, last few lines of 44 and then goes into 45. And he actually breaks it up into three sections, but it's one, it's one section, it's one prophecy. But the first section is the last few verses of 44. The, the next section is uh, the top of 45, where 45 starts. It's kind of, you know, like a sub idea. And then the last bit is is um, is starts right here. Um, uh, all these things. Um, uh, here. No, it is. It's beautiful for for uh, um, you know. So um, it kind of like here is the last section, and he says it's three. It's just kind of the end bit. Um, but it's beautiful. It's a beautiful section. It's 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 basically saying, look, God makes these things. We're part of God's creation. Nobody says, you know, to the creator, why did you do this? God's the creator. God knows why God did it. Uh, and it's what God does. These are the things that God does. So um, yeah, it's a it's a it's a really great, it's a great section. Uh and uh Wow, yeah, it's it's a it's a really good section. So here's a here's a, another here's another set of here's another set of of um, prophecies that start here with fourteen. Thus said the Lord: Egypt's wealth and Nubia's gains and Sabaites long of limb shall pass over to you and be yours. Pass over and follow you in fetters, bow low to you, and reverently address you. Only among you is God. There is no other God at all. You are indeed a God who concealed himself, O God of Israel, who bring victory. Those who fabricate idols, all are shamed and disgraced. To a man, they slink away in disgrace. But Israel, has won through the Lord, triumph everlasting. You shall not be shamed or disgraced in all the ages to come. For thus said the Lord, the creator of heaven, who alone is God, who formed the earth and made it, who alone established it. He did not create it a waste, but formed it for habitation. I am the Lord and there is none else. I did not speak in secret at a sight in a land of darkness. I did not say to the stock of Jacob, seek me out in a wasteland. I, the Lord, who foretell reliably, who announce what is true. 
Yeah. Um, he says that that's the end of, of one uh, of another section. Wow. There's a lot in there. There's a lot in that section. In my translation is several parenthetical statements. Yep. But that's not. not so, so like what? Um, What's he created the heavens parenthetically. He is God. And then who formed the earth and made it again, a parenthetical statement. He established it. Blah, 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 blah. Chaos, he found it. Uh, yeah, I, I mean, there's no reason to, there's no reason to necessarily put it in parentheses other than they're basically saying like, read it like this, yeah. you know, read it like, you know, and I did this, you know, I, it's, it, there's, I mean, it's all here. Okay. All this stuff is here. Uh, what's interesting, by the way, though, to look at that one section, it's this low tohu. Tohu vavohu, right, is chaos, so you have, here it says, he did not create it a waste, right? So God doesn't create chaos or didn't make it to be chaos. If there is chaos, you can maybe make the argument that's because we did it. But God didn't create it as chaos. God created it. God made everything. First of all, again, God made everything. That's a big part of the polemic. There's not a part that God didn't make. Somebody else didn't come through and make that which, by the way, probably is also part of the Zoroastrian idea that the god of darkness is the god of chaos, right? No, no, that's a god of God. That's God. There's no chaos, and God didn't make chaos. God created everything. Uh, Funny, it said, this, this says he did not create it, that chaos. He formed it to be inhabited. Yeah. So that makes it chaotic. Well, it makes it chaotic <laughs> to some extent, but it's with a purpose, right? That there's a sense that there is something. I don't know that I would, that's why the, it used the word habitation here too. Formed it for habitation. Um, uh, the word la shevet is the word that actually is used there, which is the word we use for to sit or to inhabit. But one could also say la shevet is also the word, it's also the root for the word Shabbat, right? Which you could also say created it for, for peace, you know, for, for being a part of something. So I would say, I would also maybe probably I've taken it maybe a step by saying it created it for a purpose. It doesn't have to be inhabited by people, right? Because some of the world is inhabited by birds, for example, or by animals. So there is a place for everything and God's creation is kind of, I think what, the, what they're trying to say. But that's not the focus I wanted you to take a look at right now, or just take a look at this, because this is perhaps um, the most important part of this little section here. Uh, theologically, this is a huge idea, and one that the rabbis definitely develop on. Take a look uh, at this line, depending on how they translate it. Um, my friends, this is maybe, again, the key to understanding God. You see, verse four, 15. But Take a look at this. Yeah. You are a God who concealed himself. Now that, in the, in the, in the same lines, by the same author, nobody's going to argue this, by the same author who says that you alone in the previous line are everything. Only you, God. There is no other God. There is no other God. But you hide yourself. You are a God who concealed it. So this idea that God isn't always seen is really interesting and really important. And for the rabbis, super important. Because when people said, well, where's God? The rabbis actually now have a place where they can actually now hang this idea on. And this is, again, was the book that Richard Friedman wrote, The Disappearance of God, that God hides. God withdraws from view. God doesn't leave. God doesn't, God doesn't um, check out. But God disappears. Disappears doesn't mean that God's not there anymore. It just doesn't appear. 
God doesn't appear. God conceals. Doesn't mean God's not there. Usually when we say the person disappeared, it means they're not there anymore. But literally means they can't be seen. Now, I know that's splitting hairs, but it's super important because it's not that God disappeared from existence. God disappears from view, which is this concept of God concealing. This is very important for the rabbis because the rabbis literally, to this day, traditional Judaism hangs this idea of the disappearance of God, or again, the concealment of God, the hiding of God, as an answer for where is God? God's there. We just can't see God. We don't, we don't see God, but God is there all the time. And they actually base this on this line. And they actually use it as a play on this word in Hebrew. Now, I already referenced this person once because she did live in Persia. Esther. Now, we know that the name Esther actually comes from the name Ishtar. That wasn't her real name. Her real name is Hadassah. The Bible tells us that she has. That's not a midrash. The Bible says that Esther had a Hebrew name. Her name was Hadassah. When she went into the Persian court, she used her name Ishtar, is Esther. That's the most pagan name you could have. Ishtar was the goddess of beauty, the goddess of the light, the goddess of the morning light. Venus. That was her name. It's a great name for a beautiful woman, but it's a very pagan name. It's, by the way, a completely legitimate now Hebrew name. There's a lot of Jews named Esther, but yeah. it's not a Jewish name. Her name was Hadassah, which means the myrtle. That's the Hadass, the myrtle that we use at Sukkot. A nice smelling plant, but it's not, it's not an idol. It's not a goddess. It's not a Everyone knew what Ishtar meant, but the rabbi said that's not what her name means. Esther is not her name from Ishtar. Her name is from this word, Mistarer. The word Seter, the, ver, the, the uh, word, the, the Shoresh, the root for, the, for this word, Satar, or Hister, is hidden. Esther is a representation of God's hiddenness, God's disappearance, God's not being able to be seen, God's concealment. Is, is that a cognitive mystery? I don't think so, but it's good. But it's not It's not mystery. It's mystery. It's mystery. The word mystery. I know, I, I'm, pre I'm pretty sure it's not, but I'm sure, I'm sure it's from Greek, mysterious or something. It's not a... I wonder if way back... Way, where, where they got it from? No. But, uh, but the Hebrew root, hyster, is super important. We call it hyster panin, the hidden face of God. There's actually, that's a concept in Judaism, the hidden face. Don. Well, isn't maybe as part of that is that, you know, when you're visible, you influence things. Mm -hmm. I mean, that's even goes in physics. You, know, you have an observation, you're changing. Yep. The uh, so, Heisenberg's I mean, principle. Yeah, exactly. So is, is part of that concept that, you know, God want, doesn't want to be seen because Correct. not being seen. Yes. You know, he'll leave more free will and things. Yes, happen. you take away the free will of people. That's yeah. that's God's yeah. answer, and so or that that's God's that's the rabbi's answer. That's where the rabbis say, "Why does God do that?" So that we because we have free will, and not only do we have free will, we have the Torah, so we know what we're supposed to do. We we as human beings can choose to do what we want, and we have the Torah. So the answer that the rabbis give is that God, you gave us the rules. You don't have to say anything more anymore. You, you've given it to us. Your job as a parent is over. And that is what the rabbis say very clearly. And they make it very clear. As we talked about at the same time that Christianity reintroduces God into the world, Judaism said, no, God doesn't do that anymore. God doesn't prophesy, doesn't give us new words. God doesn't, God, it's all there. It's already here. We have it in the book. We're done. God, thank you. You, you did a great job of raising us. And now we're taking the keys to the car and we're done. You, you, we know what you wanted us to do. Now, the interesting thing is, is that the rabbis imagine that God is pleased with that, by the way, 
right? That God is actually happy that we can now drive the car and don't need him anymore in that way. It's not that God went away and they don't want to say God's not there, but God's not going to influence our actions anymore. It's up to us. That's how they, that's how they came to terms with a world where, wow, that does not seem to be part of God's plan. Those people that just got murdered for no reason, God must have not allowed it himself to get active anymore. So that's the way they came to terms with it. So that's how the rabbis explained it. Uh, Christianity gave a different answer around the same time, but the rabbis imagined that God wanted that to happen. The, the, as we've said before, there's only two books of the Bible where God isn't mentioned. One of them is Song of Songs, and the rabbis said, well, it's love poetry. Of course, God's not going to be mentioned in the Song of Songs, even though it's very holy. It's God's not mentioned there. The other book? Esther. Esther. So where's God hidden? In Esther. God's hidden in the whole story. God's there. They won't say that God isn't there. God's doing miracles in Esther behind the scenes, kind of directing things in a very, in a very loose way. You know, God makes Ahasuerus stay up one night, so he reads his journal and remembers that he never helped Mordecai. That's God, they said. But God does, that's the way God interferes today. Very, very minor, you know, little, little tiny inspirations, but not. God's not going to jump in and, and, and create a miracle anymore. So Esther is literally the Hester Panim, is the hiddenness of God. So this line is super important because, it, again, it gives us this basis for us to say, even Isaiah said that God is hidden. Even Isaiah seems to be saying that. And he's saying it even as much as he's saying that Isaiah, Isaiah said just now, God chose Cyrus to be the king. but you know, that's about as much as God will do. God, for the most part, isn't going to, and, and and to some extent, by the way, that also says, as much as you look at, at Cyrus and what he's doing, you know, God picked him, but, you know, he's not exactly, he's not Moses. <laughs> so, uh, super important line. God is, uh, is, is, uh, hidden. But then we have this line here, I did not speak in secret and in a sight in the land of darkness. So it says that God wasn't always hidden, right? I did not speak in, in secret. It's the same word, seter. It's the same root. It's the same idea of hiddenness, but it says at a sight, uh, I did not say to the stock of, uh, of Jacob, seek me out in a wasteland. I, the Lord who foretell reliable, who announced what is true. What are they talking about? They're talking about, again, the fact that God doesn't, God, when God does speak, God doesn't speak in secret, and God hasn't spoken in secret in the past. So, interesting. So, anybody who says they're getting secret messages from Is God. also not, yeah, is also not <laughs> speaking on behalf of God. Yep, which is interesting because Isaiah, or at least second Isaiah, seems to be Doing exactly that. Speaking on behalf of God. But he's not doing it in a way, by the way, you can make the argument, he's doing it publicly in the sense that he's not keeping these, these things secret. By the way, I do want to point out, especially amongst Zoroastrian and Gnostic religions, most of them had like a secret inner circle that only knew the real secrets of what was going on. They had an inner initiated circle that were the priests. Um, Judaism never really had that in the sense that that whatever messages even Moses got, they had to be proclaimed to everybody. They had to be done publicly. So there is this sense that God doesn't, even if God speaks to one person, it's not a secret. It's an important idea, by the way, because a lot of ancient religions had an inner circle initiates who they only knew the secrets. A little bit like Freemasons. Well, yeah. No, but it was based on that kind of idea that there was, you know, initiated inner circle, the Mithra, Mithraic religions, all these religions, and the Zoroastrians had that too. But spoke to Moses saying, "Speak to, to everybody." Yeah, there doesn't seem to be anything there that God told him that you know says that's just for you, Moses. That's just for the priests. No, no. There's that Gnostic strain in Christianity, certainly. And was speaking in tongues. Very Gnostic, I think. Yeah, and I think I think to some extent, though, the Catholic Church maintained that by having an order and by having orders of of initiates that you know 
that were kind of like a little closer to God that had a little bit different, like, you know, they had, to some extent, they were speaking Latin too. Yeah, they, had, they were speaking Latin when a lot of the people didn't know Latin. And now, they were, now there's a big fight over bringing Latin back. Correct. But, you know, the they're idea. Just right down the yes, right just down the street. Right yeah. Yeah. But people, um, some people like that. Some people like that. And secret, the secret, you know, secret initiated, initiated group. It's cultish. It does. And, it does. And Judaism didn't really like it because they realized that it creates a hierarchy of knowledge that, uh, you know, Judaism didn't want there to be, didn't seem to want there to be a hierarchy of knowledge. Uh, because especially if you're speaking on behalf of God, if God's God of everybody, then is God a little bit more your God than everyone else's God, right? So, you know, I think Judaism had that, you know, that issue of the whole religion being somewhat well, we're closer to God. You guys are not closer to God. So the whole issue of then within that group, it's weird that they didn't do it, but they didn't. And again, there's always been that issue of, is Judaism too particular or is it universal? Is there that universality to it? Uh, but look, it's definitely a part of Isaiah's, uh, definitely part of his theology and, and what he's dealing with. Look at this one. Come, gather together. Draw nigh, you remnants of the nations. No foreknowledge had they who carry their wooden images and pray to a God who cannot give success. Speak up, compare testimony, let them even take counsel together. Who announced this before time? Foretold it of old. Was it not I, the Lord? Then there is no God beside me. No God exists beside me who foretells truly and grants success. Turn to me and gain success, all the ends of the earth, for I am God and there is none else. By myself have I sworn, from my mouth has issued truth, a word that shall not turn back. To me, every knee shall bend, every tongue swear loyalty. They shall say, only through the Lord can I find victory and might. When people trust in him and their adversaries are put to shame, it is through the Lord that all the offspring of Israel have vindication and glory. Um, let's, uh, yeah, no, that, that's where he says, uh, ends the, that, that section. That last section is, is like the last, uh, five, six verses. Um, um, there's a hymn with uh, every knee shall bend. Yes. There is that. Yeah, you're right. There is. Uh, the, it starts at the name of Jesus, every knee shall bend. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, I learned it the best. Yeah, I say it. Yeah. Yeah, there's, uh, but there is that. What is that? him i can't remember anyways uh there is uh there is this idea that again um everybody will worship god not just the jews right not just the jews because it says every tongue shall swear loyalty that doesn't mean you know every yeah and this is this is this is one of the Again, when you get in Isaiah, you're the first time you're going, this is a God for everybody. It's not just, if the God created everything, then it's a God for everybody. Why isn't Judaism more evangelical? Well, it was until Christianity came along and said, you know, slapped it back and said, you're not going to do that. I mean, look, the Christian Bible makes fun of Jews who sail all around the world to create one convert. The reason that that's, <laughs> that line's in the act, in Acts is because it happened. But, you know, I think Judaism, to some extent, had this, uh, you know, this tension, especially up through the temple period, which is when, you know, what would Judaism have been like if Christianity hadn't existed? And, and you know, part of my argument is, is that Christianity became the universal Judaism, you know, it became the impulses that Judaism had for universalism were taken over by Paul and by Christians, and, and they said, hey, they got it, but they didn't do it the whole way. And and I think 
the part of the problem was up until that point, the the the, the priesthood and the level of dependency on on sacrifices was so big that um, was so. Be a universal religion if everybody had to go to Jerusalem. Yeah, to pray. yeah, that's the issue. And so, because the temple was destroyed, only Except Muslims do the same thing. Yeah, no, it's true. It's true, but it's it it. It, you only have to go to, to Mecca, I think, once in, in your lifetime. lifetime. Yeah, but and you but don't it, have to go every, every four times a year. Okay. Yeah, no, it, it was the 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 problem was Judaism had um, was was only at that time starting to deal with what it would be like. I mean, look, the temple was destroyed in seventy. Jesus lived a, around thirty five. Uh, it all happened virtually at the same time. I mean, the the idea of the temple destruction, you know, what would Judaism have looked like if it was a universal religion and there was no Christianity, then then perhaps it would have been more of a universal religion. But again, I, I do believe Christianity picked up that universal impulse and 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 was more successful at it because to some extent, again, not having to keep the the laws, having to keep the mitzvot allowed for people to come into and to Jewish values without having to take on the Jewish rituals. And so I think I think it made a much that was the first council of the church. Yes. And I think they got it. I mean, they they understood that if you want to apply, if you want to appeal and have people be able to follow this, these ideas, you know, stop making them eat matzah. Stop. Actually, stop making them get circumcised. <laughs> stop making them, stop making them keep Shabbos. You know, I, I think. The argument in the beginning was yeah, yeah, and so I think when you when you said, well, is Judaism willing to give that up stuff up? No, they weren't. So that their univer the universal appeal of Judaism was was going to be problematic. Would there have been another form of Judaism that would have? Who knows? I mean, to me, it's the point is is that Christianity did do that, and so Christianity was successful at creating a universal version of Judaism. Um, you know, to me, that's what that could be my rationalization of it. But I do believe that that's what happened. You can't go back and un, you, you you can't go back and un, I mean, why would you want to anyways? I mean, I guess you, you make the argument, well, then we wouldn't have the Crusades and the Inquisition and everything else. But would you not have had some version of that anyways? I mean, you know, over, over the last 2000 years, would there not have been other forms of religious persecution if there hadn't been Christianity? It's hard for me to believe that it's only Christianity that would have done that. And it, and it didn't, because there were Muslim persecutions of, of other religions, and there were Muslim persecutions of Christianity, and there was Muslim persecutions of Judaism, and it wasn't like Christians were the only people that had religious persecutions. And would Jews have religiously persecuted people if they had gone to Africa and gone to Asia and other places, and, and if there had been a version of Judaism in, in the alternate universe where that happens, wouldn't it have also happen there? And wouldn't there have been different streams of Jews that would have killed each other during a hundred years war in Germany or wherever else it would have been? Wouldn't they there have been fought each other with pathogens? Yeah. So I I I I tend to, you know, it's hard. You never can never can answer it, but it's I don't know that human nature and human development wouldn't would have would have not found those ways anyways. You know, it's difficult for you. You can't never make that argument, but in that alternate universe where that where Jesus never lived, or there was never a, there was never a, a Christian. The, the base of Paul, let's say Paul never lived. Would that still not have happened? It's hard for me to believe there wouldn't have been some version of those things happening, anyways, and maybe even worse. So who knows? You can never make that argument. But but that's my gut. My gut tells me that that that's human beings and human nature, and it might have even been worse. So that being said, that's my take on. There, I just gave you my take on Christianity. I just gave it in honor of Easter and Reverend Lynn. I just gave you my, I just gave you my take on it. I'm, I, I'm, I'm, I'm. This is the universal approach that it and it worked. Uh, and it sometimes it wasn't great. And Jesus certainly didn't come to make a new religion. So. And and Jesus also would not have approved of people being enslaved and yes. brought over on ships to America. So I don't believe that, you know, again, those were acts of of Christianity or are based on the uh, based on uh the our best our best uh human inclinations. 
So, uh, but uh, that's that's where we're at. Now, we got to this part. We're going to finish up with this. This is the Babylonian diatribe of Isaiah. This is where Isaiah goes uh, goes on about the Babylonians, which, you know, he, he had some veiled knocks on Zoroastrianism, but those were veiled. Those were those were not what you're about to see, which is this is about the Babylonians and their stupid, stupid gods, and they are really stupid. So here you go. Bell is bowed. Nebo is cowering. Their images are a burden for beasts and cattle. The things you would carry in procession are now piled as a burden on tired beasts. They cowered. They bowed as well. They could not rescue the burden, and they themselves went into captivity. Listen to me, O house of Jacob, all that are left of the house of Israel, who have been carried since birth, supported since leaving the womb. Till you grow old, I will still be the same. When you turn gray, it is I who will carry. I was the maker, and I will be the bearer, and I will carry and rescue you. To whom can you compare me or declare me similar? To whom can you liken me so that we seem comparable? Those who squander gold from the purse and weigh out silver on the balance, they hire a metal worker to make it into a god to which they bow down and prostrate themselves. They must carry it on their backs and transport it. When they put it down, it stands. It does not budge from its place. If they cry out to it, it does not answer. It cannot save them from their distress. Okay, so pause right there. This is kind of that first section, this this um, this uh, knock against the Babylonians. So the god uh, Bel and Nebo, those are um, those are the Babylonian gods. Um, these are uh, again uh, basically they're 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 garbage. They're garbage. They're trash. Um, one of the things that the Persians did when they destroyed the Babylonian uh, kingdom in Babylon, modern-day Baghdad, uh, they tore down all the altars. They tore down all the altars to Bel and Nebo. Nebo is the god of Nebuchadnezzar. Right? Bel is the na is the god of Nebo. <laughs> oh, oh, Mike. Yeah. So. Uh, Finding Nebo, uh, so no. Uh, Bel Bel Marduk is the is one of their main gods. Um, so so you, so you have, so you have these gods that are that are uh, stupid. Yeah, they're garbage. They're they're useless. So uh, they Isaiah does not hold back the second Isaiah, whatever. He does not hold back about the Babylonian stupid gods. Um, Brain, so. <laughs> so these gods are are uh, you thought they were you thought they were powerful. Why did you think they were powerful? Because Nebuchadnezzar destroyed the temple, so his god must have been pretty good. Now you might have had Jews that started worshiping Bel and Nebo when they went into when they went into exile. How do we know? Because we read in the book of Daniel. That these guys were pressed into service for their god, for their Babylonian gods. They got taken in and were made part of the Babylonian court. They were made eunuchs. They were made priests and made servants in the courts and in the palaces and in the temples of the Babylonian gods. Why? Because that's what happens when you win. Your god's better than my god, and now we worship your god. The whole issue of what Daniel does is he says, I'm not going to worship those guys. I'm not going to worship Nebo and Marduk. I'm not going to, I'm not going to worship those guys. By the way, Marduk? Mordecai? Hello? Oh, yes. That's their God. There's nothing in the readings, at least, that we know of, where they're downplaying the gods of Egypt. And we lived there for Yes, other than the fact that the plagues attack their gods too, right? Yeah. So, but yes, there isn't this kind of making fun of Ra and Osiris. Could be, could be. Well, 
Yes, but there was, there is, there is a weird thing that we don't knock flat out the worship of their gods, other than the plagues destroyed their right. gods too. But yes, there isn't this polemic about the, they, we don't name them. Some people say that that was actually intentional not to even invoke those names. So there's this idea that like we totally purged is that what the Bible of those things. Here's the, probably the easiest word, you know, bowing down to Ra and so on and so forth. Uh, there definitely seems to be that understanding yeah. of it. Look, we, we don't know how pervasive it was, but it was seems as though they did a big excise of, of Egyptian gods. Look, the, the Canaanite gods, the Ammonite gods, the Moabite gods, we get more information yeah. about them, but or at least we get their names. The Bible really purged those out. There really isn't references to Ra. The only Ra mentioned is Ramses, right. the city of Ramses. It's the only place. Uh, it's pretty. It's pretty. Was pretty efficient. The purging of Egyptian deities from the Bible, so much so that, for sure, look, we know that Moses's name was not Moses. Right. It was Ra Moses. It was Tut Moses. It was some Moses before it. There was some God before Moses. Moses means from the God. That's what it means. Oh, really? Tut Moses means from Tut. Ra Moses, Moses means from Ra. Moses means something from something. There was a God's name before his name. Purged, done, not even known. Was it Tut Moses? Who knows? Sobek Moses? We don't know. Purged. Because it's, it's literally the name means from the God, from him. It's like if you had a German whose name was Fa. Von what? Right. Von what? Right. Exactly. Von what? There's something. You add something after Von. There's something missing there. So we know. Or, oh, yeah. The guy's name was just O. It wasn't O. Or Mac. The guy's name was Mac. Really? Mac what? McDonald? Mac, McDay? You know, McDay? What, what was the Mac? So, yes, it didn't, wasn't just that. We know that. So. I never heard that there was a, a name. I never. I don't think you've ever talked about that before. Yeah, yeah. I have, but but it's okay. I don't talk about it a lot, and it's not. It's so so purged that it's so purged that it's purged from our minds. Look, people people don't like to talk about it, but we know Moses. What that wasn't his name. That's the other thing the Bible tells us, right? That's the name that Pharaoh's daughter gave him. Why would she give him a Jewish name? She doesn't know. We don't know. We don't really know what his Hebrew name was. His mother gave him a name. Yocheved gave him a name. We just don't know what it was. No. But it's just weird because it's another name that is a pagan name. It's scary. <laughs> when Moses was drawn to Ra, people asked for an idol. It never means the idol. Yeah, no. no. It, all this was purged. And that was an Egyptian god that they worshipped. Look, we know that he was looked Egyptian. The Bible says it. The Bible says he looked Egyptian. But not only that, the I mean, why wouldn't he have? Why he was raised by Egyptians. And 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 the Midrash is pretty pretty comfortable saying that. But the Midrash does give some of the possible names that he had. So the Midrash gives us several names that might have been Moses' birth name, but they know it. It's just interesting that the names that we think of as Jewish names are not Jewish names. And my name is Moshe, so I'm, I have that name. But every Jew who has the name Esther, every Jew that has the name Mordecai, they're all carrying pagan gods' names. Some of the most common Jewish names. Not all of them. Not all of them. I didn't say all of them. But some of the more common, very recognizable Jewish names are kind of pagan. Anyways, so we're, we'll, read, we'll read one more section before we wrap up here with... Uh, so this is another, this is a, another like unit, if you will. Here's a little unit. Keep yeah. this in mind and stand. Take this to heart, you sinners. Bear in mind what happened of old. For I am God and there is none else. I am divine and there is none like me. I foretell the end from the beginning. And from the start, things that had not occurred I say, my plan shall be fulfilled. I will do all I have purposed. I summon that swooping bird from the east, from a distant land, the man for my purpose. 
I have spoken, so I will bring it to pass. I have designed it, so I will complete it. Listen to me, you stubborn of heart, who are far from victory. I am bringing my victory close. It shall not be far, and my triumph shall not be delayed. I will tr grant triumph in Zion to Israel, in whom I glory. Yeah, well, that's really nice. It's really short, by the way, chapter, but it's also that end of that unit. Um, a lot of nice ideas in there, too. But ones that we've, some of them, obviously, we already saw. There's I am God and there's none else. Saw that already today. Uh, and again, it's, it's like I don't know why, right? I am or Alenu, right? I am God. There ain't ain't owed, ain't owed. We say that ain't owed, right? Oh, yeah. Find his salvation throughout. Uh, um, yours yours says salvation. Better translation. The word, the word uh, Teshua T, and here is it Teshua, is the word, word Yeshua, right? Which means salvation, to see, to be saved. Um, oh, yeah. It seems so different. Yeah. Yeah. Um, salvation. Yeah, it's salvation's tr truer to the root of the word Yeshua, right? Uh it is a sense of salvation. Uh, yeah, triumph seems to be like you won in a war. Saving is like I, I rescued you and you've been saved rather than uh, rather than than the victory in battle. But the word is used twice. So however, they translated as triumph both times. Um, look, there's several ideas here though too, which is, uh, uh, by the way, Victory is not the way yours is translated or yours, right? What does it say? Uh, I'm bringing my karafti. I'm bringing close my what? What's the translation you have for victory? Does it have righteousness? I have my, my justice? My glory. My glory. Hmm. I, I don't like Yeah. The King James is closer to that. It's the word sadaka, right? Which means righteousness, justice. Victory. You know, we've seen that translation before, but it's more of that balance, right? It's more of, well, not necessarily balance, but vindication, you know, uh, rectification, uh, fixing the stuff, you know, writing the stuff. Sedek has a translation of, again, evening the balances, you know, uh, you know, uh, doing the right thing, making making sure everything's the where we're in the right place. Um, you know, look, victory <laughs> seems to be like a another level of it, which is like somebody won and somebody lost. This also has a, 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 a feeling like God's going to fix these things. God's going to save us. God's going to take, and it's not so much necessarily a sense of war, but it's, it's a sense of uh, uh, writing things and making things back to the way they're supposed to be. Tzedek is righteousness. It's justice. It's the way things are supposed to be, which you could translate it as, again, I'm bringing my, I'm bringing my, um, fixed world it's and it's not far away right and uh it will not be delayed right the 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 salvation will not be delayed deliverance, deliverance? it's better translation it has a better sense of god's doing the work and it doesn't necessarily mean that someone's going to lose but this really does this translation really does give us a sense that yeah there's a person that's going to be on the other end of this in meaning there's somebody who get beaten up Look, the, the purpose of this too, to some extent, and again, this is what Bleckensop says, this is reassurance for doubters. I don't I think he goes a little too far, but but he does say, you know, and again, I like the way Rosemary read it, you know, uh it, you sinners, right? There's a sense that, like, you know, you people don't get it. I don't think that's what you're trying. Well, maybe it says you're sinners, something of their heart. Uh verse eight. Verse. It says something about someone's heart, right? What does it yours say, Mary? Oh, transgressors! Your transgressors, sinners is even maybe stronger. I would say, but but you know, again, people who've messed up. So so there's a sense that you people don't get it, but but this is the thing. I have a plan. It's coming. To, it's going to happen, and he says right here, it's not far off. Okay, and that's the important thing. It's close. He says it two times. It's close. It's not far. It's not far away. It's coming soon. This saving is going to happen. 
And again, it does happen because Cyrus does let the people go back and they, and they can go back if they want. So this, this, this tzedek, this good stuff is happening, this salvation, this deliverance is going to happen. But of course, these lines have comforted people for thousands of years. When things have been bad, people have, have looked at these lines and said, hey, this is, not, this is going to happen. When's it going to happen? Plan. Yeah. Yeah. And it's part of the plan. And even again, even when Cyrus doesn't deliver, which by the way, I do want to point out, even though it was just last chapter, there seems to be already a little bit, maybe a little bit of this line right here. I summoned that swooping bird from the east, Cyrus. Right, that man for my purpose. He doesn't even call him out by name here. So it seems a little bit less Cyrus is the Messiah, but more like he's just doing God's plan. He's part of a plan, and he already said before, like Cyrus doesn't even get it. But here it almost he doesn't even it almost seems like he's frustrated with Cyrus a little bit at this point, where he's saying, you know, maybe he's starting to say that guy. He doesn't even call him Cyrus anymore. <laughs> But I don't know. I mean, you know, some people have said this is a reflection of a, a later part of, hey, when's Cyrus going to do what he says he's going to do? And and the people are being told by Isaiah, don't worry, it's coming soon. That guy, he's part of God's plan, and it's going to happen. So not something you have to worry about even though if it's not happening as fast as we wanted it to, and it's not happening the way we wanted to, why do we say that? Because that's the way it happened. It didn't happen as fast as they wanted it to. It took them a few years. Cyrus had his hands full. He had other problems besides the Jews not having access to their home. He had to put down his own rebellions. He had to put down the Babylonians. So the Jews seemed to say, yeah, put those Babylonians down. Of course, they destroyed Jerusalem. We want them to be put down. But, you know, let's wait. And again, it's very reminiscent of, to some extent, what happened in the last, well, happened 75 years ago when Israel was established. The West is our, is our salvation. The Americans, the British are our salvation. It didn't quite happen as fast as we wanted to. Well, it's going to happen. Relax. People said, why is Roosevelt not saving the Jews? Hey, we got to beat the Nazis and we can get back. People said the same thing. Not exactly. Not exactly. But there were excuses made for that and said, people said, look, we got to beat the Nazis first. And, and the reason Give them time. those excuses is so that God is on top. Yeah. And so God, it's all part of God's plan. It just might take us a little longer, but don't worry. It's not far off. And so that's what people were given hope by. They were given hope by this idea that, that it's going to be close. No and what God is in charge. Yeah. And no matter what, God will deliver. And again, don't worry, because it's not far away. And here, it's, it's not far away. And of course, you know, based on what we know, Isaiah was right. It took another 40, 50 years for the people to you know, finally rebuild the temple and, and get everything back that they wanted. But they got it back. So this is like 530, 538, whatever, 540. Um, you know, it took, it took a few years. But and again, some people say this shows Isaiah's frustration with, with, uh, with Cyrus, but it, it, you know, could have just people, you know, people, uh, people are going to be done. Uh, next week, we're going to be online. We'll be uh, continuing a little bit of this rant against Babylon. Get down, sit in the dust, Babylon. And again, Babylon is compared to a woman here. Guess what? We were compared to a woman. We were fair Zion, right? Mar Mar made in Zion, right? Now it's made in Babylon. And by the way, that was Isaiah, but first Isaiah. So second Isaiah picks up that theme of a woman being, um, you know, the nation being the, 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 a woman. And uh, not, you're not going to be a fair woman anymore. So we will be online next week reading 47 through probably 50. And again, um, you want to read more about Cyrus, uh, read more about him. Thank you, everybody. We'll see you tomorrow night, too. We'll be reading numbers. We're reading some numbers. No, we're reading the book of numbers. So take care, everybody.
And uh, thanks for being here. Thanks, Rabbi. Bye.